Welcome to The Writing Life. Uh, today I'm here speaking with Elizabeth Spires. My name is Michael Collier. Elizabeth Spires is a poet. She's published five books. Her most recent is Now the Green Blade Rises. She's also the author of four children's books, uh, highly acclaimed The Mouse of Amherst, which is a wonderful and, and charming book. Um, and Elizabeth is also the editor of a collection of essays by uh, Josephine Jacobson called The Instant of Knowing. Um, what I thought we would do is just have you read a poem to begin, begin with, and the one that I'd like you to read is called The Paper Maker. Okay. Um, I guess I should say something before I read this poem. Good. Uh, there are times when I can't write um, blank periods, and this poem um, probably got started during one of those periods. I decided since I couldn't write, I would go back to the source, and, and the source for me was taking a paper making course. So I actually have made paper, although I imagine that this poem is about another paper maker. So how, uh, uh, let me just ask, how long ago was the paper maker making course that you took? Well, I mean, it was not a recent um, So you're thinking back. Course. Yeah, I'm thinking back. Um, uh, and the poem has an epigraph, so I guess I should include that. This is um, <clears throat> an epigraph written by a Zen monk. Last year's poverty was not yet true poverty. This year's poverty is at last true poverty. Last year there was nowhere to place the gimlet. This year the gimlet itself is gone. The paper maker. In the hot heat of deep summer, I dream of paper white as snow, white winter paper drying in the hills. The days repeat. Each sheet is the first sheet, alive, without ego, still, until the poet speaks. Here is the white field. Here is the white field waiting. A black brush, a crow, walks there, flies off. What do I know? The eye disappearing is the crow flying, the clumsy crow. Sweating, I wake, holding nothing in my hands. Again, I have dreamed the dream of paper. And what, you patiently ask, is true poverty? This sheet that I give you, upon which nothing is written. So you wrote that after not having written for a while, and did that create a kind of resonance for you that opened other doors? Well, I think sometimes, I, I've been told that sometimes when you can't write, you should write something about not being able to write. And it seems to me if you write a poem about a blank <laughs> sheet of paper or making paper, that's kind of is the same type of thing. Yeah. So, I hadn't thought about this, but you, I think you also have an exercise about using colors. Mm -hmm. And the, the word in that is white, isn't it? Um, I, I sometimes suggest to my students when I'm teaching a workshop um, that they thread some color mm -hmm. through a poem. It, they could choose what color they wanted, um, but white would be one that they yeah. could. Okay, so this is your fifth book. Mm -hmm. um, talk a little bit about how you started. Did, did you start writing as a poet, or were you doing other kinds of writing? Uh, how did you come to, to write? Well, I guess I could go back to not so much writing in childhood, but um, being a great reader in childhood, mm -hmm. basically reading my way through childhood. And I think at about the age of 12 is when I formed this notion that I would be a writer. And probably it, I can think of two inspirations to me then. One was um, Flannery O'Connor, 
I, I read a lot of short stories at that age. I read all the volumes of uh, the O. Henry Awards. Um, that, that was basically one of the things my little library in my little town in Ohio, they had all the that O. Henry is. Awards. Yeah. And I remember reading Everything That Rises Must Converge. And I don't know why, but that particular story uh -huh. really hit me. And I thought the most wonderful thing in the world would be to, to write. And I thought I would possibly be a short story writer. Um, but around the same time was when I was first introduced to Emily Dickinson uh -huh. by a teacher. And so that, I think, also kind of pushed me in that direction. Um, I ended up, not quite sure why, but in college when I really started writing um, and being, I think, somewhat serious about it, um, I s wrote poems, not mm -hmm. short stories. Did you have teachers in college that were writers? I had a, um, I had a teacher um, at Vassar, Judith Kroll, who's a poet. Mm -hmm. She teaches in Texas, and she was, that was inspirational to have somebody teaching me who was writing her poems and publishing her poems. Yeah. And um, an, another <clears throat> professor at Vassar, um, William Gifford, was uh -huh. um, an inspiration and a wonderful teacher. So did you have any sense of yourself uh, in, in a line with Elizabeth Bishop and Marianne Moore? Well, Elizabeth who? Bishop had um, graduated from Vassar in 1934, and I graduated in 1974. And that's when I first started reading her work. Uh -huh. uh, and at the time, I wanted to love it, but I, uh, I liked it, but I didn't love it. I mean, I couldn't penetrate it yeah. very deeply. Um, but I must say that over the years, I've gotten to know her work so well, and um, I know that it's been an influence, a really mm -hmm. big influence. It's interesting, because I think that... Um, I remember trying to read Bishop about the same time and really finding it flat in comparison to some of the poets who you know, were being read, like Berryman or, or even Lowell or, or Plath. They had sort of more surface texture. You didn't have to work as hard to get at it. And I think that that was closer to the ethos of, of the time as well. We were going to school, I'm, you know, I know our ages, and we were going to school at the same time, and the confessional poets were the rage. And yeah. then also, I think it was easier to identify, unfortunately, with those poets who were, well, I don't know, burying their soul. Yeah, sure. Um, Sexton and Plath and yeah. um, Robert Lowell. Um, so, but in a way, much as I admire some of the poems of Plath and Robert Lowell still, uh, in a way, I'm not so interested in those poets now. Yeah. It's a kind of tortoise and hare thing, if you think about it, that Bishop, the, the work was so well made, and there wasn't as much of it, it was carefully let out, uh, but it, it lives longer for that. Sometimes um, your infatuations fade, but your kind of other poets become like best friends for life. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's how I think yeah. of it. Well, let's let's try and uh, let's read another poem. The, uh, the other poem I thought we might look at is is Riddle, okay. and one of the reasons I I wanted to have you read this, I think it's a delightful poem, but also um, you in your children's books you use riddles, mm -hmm. and I also think that. The, the idea, riddle is really an early, one of the earliest forms of, of a poem is a riddle, or a, a rune is one of the earliest kinds of poems, or, or a magic spell. And um, I hoped you'd read it and then maybe just talk a little bit about that, if okay. there's something that strikes um, you about it. This is the only poem called Riddle that I've written for adults, although I've written probably 75 riddles at least for children. Uh -huh. But this poem... Um, um, is a poem, and it's, it's a poem about um, um, the speaker in relationship to um, their mother. <clears throat> Riddle. What you were and were not, I was. Both you and not you. I grew by taking from you. Once, years ago, the scrim parted. We were in the car, smoke from your cigarette spiraling around you. And I, a child, 
saw you for a moment as someone unfamiliar, apart from me, as I might see a stranger on the street. Older, I looked at you and saw myself, saw more than I was prepared to see. Our last best selves survive. They shine in a dim place, and I am more and less than what I was. The riddle now, not who you were, mother, but what am I? I guess I was thinking about the fact that, um, well, first off, in certain ways, I would say most of us think of our parents as ciphers. I mean, we know them so well and we've spent so much time with them, but there's this part of them that remains a kind of mystery. Yeah. And I, I, it's in the poem itself, but I remember um, being in the car with my mother when I was a child, maybe seven or eight, and she'd been utterly familiar up to me to that moment. And all of a sudden I just looked at her, and I looked at her with some sort of, um, all of a sudden she seemed strange to me. And it was a, it was a kind of unnerving <laughs> moment to, to look at your mother and not see somebody utterly familiar. And, and the poem also comes out of the whole sense of um, how so much of what we are and um, what our, um, uh, how should I put it, um, our own sense of self-definition comes partly out of our relationship to our parents mm -hmm. and how that might change, too, when they're not there anymore. Yeah. So. The, the other thing I like about the poem, too, is there's a, a kind of consciousness about the, the speaker who is clearly in, in the middle. There's, there's the mother and there's the sense of the speaker as a child. She has as herself as a child. But there's a kind of identification she has with the parent, with the mother, understanding that she now is kind of where the mother was, uh, that, that mm -hmm. in, in, where she is in her life now is where the, mo where the mother uh, was when she was remembering this. Well, probably, I think at the, you know, there's the, probably by the end of the poem, I mean, at first, our parents may be riddles, but maybe we become, we become a riddle to ourselves. Uh -huh as we move through certain kind of stages of life. Well, especially as we realize how much we're like our parents. Mm -hmm. And that we're not... Disturbing thought, yeah, isn't it? Is. <laughs> it can be. <laughs> yeah, good thought and a disturbing thought. <laughs> yeah, well, it's shocking because you always think you're, you're not going to be like them. The older, you, the older I found that the older I am, the more I realize how much I am, how much I have for my parents and how much I'm like my parents yeah. and then or you know rebellious early phase when you're young in your 20s yeah. you think you're utterly utterly different yeah, yeah. Um, I remember talking to uh, uh, Philip Levine a long long time ago it was shortly after my first book had been published and I was desperate to be writing a different kind of poem because I thought that that's what you had to do you had to with each book you had to completely reinvent yourself. I think it's... Poem sort of, by poem? Yeah, well, mm -hmm. it's kind of a modernist notion that you have to be original at, at every turn. Uh, not, not a very good notion, I think. I think a wrong-headed notion. So I was pleading my case to him, saying that I really wanted to... You know, I, I thought I was doing the thing you're supposed to do, which is to say, you know, I want to write these new poems. And he said something to me that I've always remembered and, and gone back to, and it was really important, although it was really simple. It was one of those obvious things. He just said, well, you know, it doesn't really work that way. You can't just will a, a different sort of poem. You can't, you can't will a stylistic right. change. It has to come from your life. And there's always a relationship between the work and the life. That doesn't, that, that doesn't mean it's confessional. But there's a kind of necessity that comes out of where you are here and now uh, that impinges or pushes the work. I, I totally agree. I think of... Um well, I've been thinking about this whole business of, of how the poems come out of the life, even when they're not confessional poems. And I remember reading um, um, something by um, Czeslaw Milos. He talked about poetry as the story of a soul. Mm. You know, and I, I uh -huh. think a little bit of this kind of pilgrim soul on their journey. The journey is the life you're given. <clears throat> um, I think of it as a timeline. 
we're on a kind of timeline. I guess timelines were in my mind because my daughter was given the assignment to, to do a timeline of uh -huh. her life. And she had to put what the milestone moments were. And I was thinking, well, really, poems, a lot of times, are our milestones. They may only be milestones to us. You know, they may be many milestones. Yeah. But they're these... I guess it, it almost is so obvious it doesn't need to be said, but these um, significant moments for us. And sometimes they get transformed so that it doesn't appear that it has anything at all to do with experience. Uh -huh. but. Yeah, quite often. And there, there is always a secret rela relationship between the poet and the poem that's completely different than uh, the relationship of a reader to, to the poem. And they do mark those moments. Um, Many of the poems, well, not many, but quite a few of the poems in, in this book are about your mother's death. And uh, they're, they're amazingly powerful. They're some of the most powerful poems uh, about uh, a mother-daughter relationship that I know. Um, and I, I hope you would read a, a, a couple of them. Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll read one called My Mother's Doll. Um, and this poem, there is actually a doll, um, I mean, that I'm thinking of. Mm -hmm. It's actually a life-size doll that my mother had that my grandmother made for her. And she became kind of member of our family. I mean, she always sat there, and we would attribute feelings <laughs> to this doll as she sat in one of the armchairs. <laughs> so um, this is a poem about the doll. Um, um, after, um, after my mother died. My mother's doll. After she died, I found you slumped in the living room where she kept you. A rag doll, tall as I was, made years ago by my grandmother. You stared straight ahead, your mouth a thin, unsmiling line. One fingerless hand flopped across your chest. Dark secret keeper, big sister in pain, you used to amuse us with your mood, making perpetual despair look easy as you sat, mute and gloomy as a cloud, listening to all that we said. When I closed up her apartment, I propped you up in the straight back chair, but wondered later, at home in my own bed, if it was the right thing to do. I imagined you sitting in darkness all winter, the blinds drawn, only the dust to keep you company. Did your heart beat faster when you heard the hum of the refrigerator, when a ladder fell through the mail slot? Or did you lapse into a sleep deeper than my own, cold, dark, profound, where winter passed in a dream and you in your solitude, were nothing, no one, because she wasn't there to speak your name. Coming back this summer, I opened the blinds and let light stream into the room. Dust motes swirl without meaning in the air. Outside, the pear tree is in bloom, but you don't turn your head. I pick you up and hold you in my arms. Then eye to eye, I waltz you round the room to make my daughter laugh, my daughter who barely knew my mother. When we leave, I'll straighten your blue dress, comb your mop of hair into a neat page boy. Then I'll put you back into the chair until the next time, because I cannot imagine it empty, cannot imagine this room without you. The doll, by the way, um, didn't have a smile on her face. She was made by my grandmother to have this kind of gloomy expression, <laughs> which allowed us to project lots of emotions onto the doll. And uh, where's the doll now? Um, the doll has taken a cross-country trip. <laughs> it, the, um, my mother's doll lived in Ohio, and um, my father's now taken the doll to California. Uh -huh. So she now lives in your Palm Springs. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a really beautiful poem um, and touching. Uh, 
the idea of using the doll as the, as the surrogate, though, is it's very powerful. When well, you, doll, dolls are surrogates a lot, I think, even yeah. whether they're life size or small. Yeah, I've always had uh, problems with dolls because they seem so real. Well, they seem conscious, don't they, in yeah. some way? Yeah, and they also seem to be thinking things about you. That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sentient. Yeah. W would you read another poem? Okay. About, about um, your mother? Um, I read one. Um, it's a um, guzzle. <clears throat> and a guzzle is a Persian form. It's in couplets. And you'll notice there's a repetition. Um, I know you've written guzzles of, um, um, of the word morning keeps coming up in the poem. <clears throat> and I, I really got started on this poem um, because of um, our friend and poet, Aga Shahid Ali, who um, wrote so many beautiful guzzles. And I felt that even though I could never match his, I would try to write one. Did he badger you into trying to Well, do he it? badgered <laughs> me, but I didn't feel this would be worthy to show him because his technical, he had mm. um, certain rules, and I think I broke them. So, guzzle. My name in the black air called out in the early morning. A premonition dreamed. Waking, I beheld a future of mourning. Our partings were rehearsals for the final scene, you and I in a desert, saying goodbye on a white September morning. The call came west. I flew west again. Impossible, but the sun didn't move. I stepped off the plane, and it was still morning. I've always worn black. Now a blank whiteness outlines everything. What shall I put on this loneliest of mornings? You've left an envelope inside your black pearl earrings and a note. Your grandmother's good in ink, the color of mourning. I remember the songs you used to sing, blue morning glories on the vine. An owl in the tree of heaven, all of my childhood sacred mornings. Your mother before you, her mother before her, I before my daughter. It's simple, I hear you explain. We are all daughters in mourning. I was your namesake, a firstborn Elizabeth entering the world on a May morning. I cannot go back to that morning. It resonates with uh, Aga Shahil Ali's own guzzles because he, he wrote some of them about his own mother's passing. Mm -hmm. And um, there's that connection with it as well. Um, it seems to me that we do write poems quite often that um, relate to other poets or were inspired by other poets. And I know that you've had a, a long friendship with Josephine Jacobson. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, there's a poem that I'd like you to, to read. Perhaps we'll, we'll end with it. Okay. But maybe you could just say a little bit about that relationship. Um, it's, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I feel like our friends, however important we thought our friends were, they become more important to us. Mm -hmm. um, that might sound a little corny or sentimental, but um, um, midlife is part of that. Part of being in the middle of your life is um, looking around at the friends you have. And Josephine Jacobson um, has been such a good friend and such an inspiration to me. And she's, um, at this point, she's, she's an older friend. She's 94. Uh, we had planned, this poem I'm going to read, um, we'd made a big plan to um, go to the Topiary Gardens north of Baltimore, mm -hmm. the Ladue Le Topiary Gardens. And um, at the, Josephine found that it was not something she was going to be able to do. It was a little too arduous to, to go to the gardens. Um, and I had, I had just imagined, in a way, the whole scene out there. I, I love those gardens anyway. 
And this poem is written as if we did go. So mm. I gave it to her in place of the place of the afternoon that we didn't have. Uh, I guess I should say also that it, I'm using something as the title from John Dunn. Um, John Dunn, in one of his sermons, he makes this claim, in heaven it is always autumn. And that's, that's how I feel. It's my favorite season. Mm. So those words were inspirational to me um, as I began this poem um, for Josephine. The figure in the poem at the end is, I think, of Josephine. In heaven it is always autumn. The leaves are always near to falling there, but never fall. And pairs of souls out walking heaven's paths no longer feel the weight of years upon them. Safe in heaven's calm, they take each other's arm, the light shining through them, all joy and terror gone. But we are far from heaven here, in a garden ragged and unkept, as Eden would be with the walls knocked down, the paths littered with the unswept leaves of many years, bright keepsakes for children of the fall. The light is gold, the sun pulling the long shadow soul out of each thing, disclosing an outcome. The last roses of the year nod their frail heads, like listeners listening to all that's said to ask, what brought us here? What seed? What rain? What light? What forced us upward through dark earth? What made us bloom? What wind shall take us soon, sweeping the garden bare? Their voiceless voices hang there, as ours might, if we were roses too. Their beds are blanketed with leaves, tended by an absent gardener whose life is elsewhere. It is the last of many last days. Is it enough? to rest in this moment, to turn our faces to the sun, to watch the liniments of a world passing, to feel the metal of a black iron chair, cool and eternal, press against our skin, to apprehend a chill as clouds pass overhead, turning us to shivering shade and shadow, and then to be restored small miracle, the sun shining brightly as before. We go on, you leading the way, a figure leaning on a cane that leaves its mark in the earth. My friend, you have led me farther than I have ever been, to a garden in autumn, to a heaven of impermanence, where the final falling off is slow, a slow and radiant happening. The light is gold, and while we're here, I think it must be heaven. Thank you. It's a wonderful poem. And thanks for, for reading and talking about your work with us. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you for being here and on the show, too. I've enjoyed it tremendously. And thank you for joining us on The Writing Life.